Okay, so today we're going to talk about validity, which is the second of the three ways we can evaluate tests and the measurement on tests. So validity. So what is validity? And you should remember that from your readings this week. So validity is the appropriateness of the interpretations of a test. So essentially, do tests measure what you want to measure? And again, my discussion of validity might vary a little bit from Popham's definition, so I'm hoping that I can explain this with a little bit more clarity than Popham was able to. So validity is, am I measuring what I want to measure? It's a matter of degree, right? Things can, our interpretations can be more or less valid. It depends upon that interpretation of the score. So again, a test itself can't be valid. It's all, the, uh, it's all about the interpretation of the test. Just like the test can't be reliable, only the scores on tests. So I can't say, well, the WISC is a valid test. It's only the interpretations that I make about, a, about the WISC score that can be valid. So just be really careful when you're writing up your lab, your um, standardized case study this week, that you're careful about your language here. Okay, so let's talk about um, some interpretations of the verbal section of the SAT. So do you remember taking that? It has the analogies and the the sentence completion sections, right? So um, a valid interpretation. It validly measures a student's ability to complete analogies, right? I can definitely say that. Um, it measures a student's vocabulary, right? Verbal section, definitely a measure of vocabulary. What about its ability to succeed in college? We certainly use the verbal section of the SAT as a measure of a student's ability to succeed in college, right? What about a student's critical thinking ability. Certainly, we use it to measure students' critical thinking. It's not as valid as just their vocabulary or their ability to complete analogies, but it's certainly a valid interpretation. But what about their math ability? The verbal section of the SAT, while highly correlated to the math section, does not measure their math ability. So if I said that verbal section's a good measure of their math ability, that would not be a valid interpretation. So I can't say the verbal, sec the verbal section of the SAT is a valid test, right? So if I'm using that test for math, I'm not using it in a valid way, right? Okay. So there's four sources of information about validity. There's test content, there's response processes, there's internal structure, and there's relation to other variables. Test content in relation to other variables, the two really important ones, the ones we're going to spend a lot of time on. And I'm just going to briefly measure, mention the other two. So let's talk about test content. So validity evidence based upon test content. Um, we have content validity, um, which includes item sampling. Um, and again, do the items that I included on the test adequately measure the construct? So remember we talked about in our kind of um, previous lectures that there's maybe an infinite number of questions I could ask about the Civil War. I picked 20 of them to be on my test. Do those 20 that I picked adequately measure the construct I'm interested in? And that kind of depends on how I define the construct. So if I'm talking about third grade math, if I only include addition and subtraction problems, is that good item sampling? It depends on how I define third grade math. If third grade math is only concerned with addition and subtraction, then I'm good. But if I define third grade math to also include fractions and measurement, then I haven't included the whole of the construct. So item sampling depends on how I define the construct, right? Um, developmental care, so how that test is developed. So it's really important if I think about, did I use content experts? Have I um, thought about the instructional design? Have I thought about the instruction the students received? Have I gone back to that? Have I thought about beginning with the end in mind? Those kinds of things. External reviews, so who else looked at the test? Uh, Popham goes into quite a bit of detail on this. Um, for our own classroom assessments, we're probably not using external reviews in the same way, but we still might be asking our peers to review that test. And in fact, when we get to our own test development in a few weeks, we will be asking our peers to review that a little bit. And then alignment. Does it align to our content? So the standards that we're trying to, to assess, the level of thinking that we're asking them to to use, so that knowledge comprehension level, an application level, and then a deep thinking level. The process and skills we're asking them to do, 
So are we asking them to recall or to apply or to match or the, the verbs that are in those, um, um, in those standards? And then the breadth of knowledge, so that whole content area. Um, when we're thinking about the, the developmental care of the test content, we also might be thinking about developing a test blueprint. Um, there's an outline of the objectives with the percent of content that each objective should have. This helps us really plan um, systematically what's on the test. If I just go to write a test, oftentimes I write a lot of items about the types of objectives that are easy to write items about, and then I forget to write items or I don't write as many items about the types of things that are harder to write items about even if those items might be the things that are most important. So we're going to practice when we start to develop tests about having test blueprints. You can also look at the test blueprints for our major test tests in our state and see what will be on that test. It'll help us prepare our students and know what's really important. It usually tells us the level of thinking that's needed and it helps systemize our thinking and our professional development, our professional judgment. So here's an example of a sample test blueprints. So you can see um, here's the learning objective, here's the, the level of thinking that's required, and here's the number of tests and the point value, so the percent weight of the test. So we can see that each learning outcome has a taxonomy classification and, the, and um, a number of test items. I could also here have um, the type of items and then how many of each item type for each. Um, objective. And we'll look more at that later when we get to test development as well. But just know that we need to be systematic in the way that we develop tests, and it's easier to do that in the test development process. We can also have evidence-based upon response processes. And again, we're not using this a whole lot in the test development, but, we're really, but this is really where we're thinking about how the students and what types of processes they're using to, um, to answer test items. So it's really this analysis of, of how they're answering. Also, evidence based upon internal structure. So that, remember that construct is that um, unobservable trait or characteristic, that latent variable that we're measuring, and um, how well that construct is, defi is defined was based upon that internal consistency reliability that we talked about um, when we talked about reliability. So. How well is that construct defined and how well do we match to that? Um, and again, we're not using that a lot on an educational tests. It's more used for things like um, affective measures. And then finally, we'll talk about validity evidence based upon relations to other variables. And there's a couple of different ways that we can really think about this relation to other variables. So, um, and this will go back to our discussion of correlations. If we think back to um, last week's um, PowerPoints. So these test criterion relationships and convergent discriminant evidence. So first we'll talk about test criterion relationships. So how well does the test predict some sort of criterion variable? Um, so uh, the kind of classic example here is SAT and college GPA. So how well does the SAT predict college GPA? And the answer is it's not the best predictor. In fact, high school GPA is a much better predictor of college GPA, but certainly SAT is one predictor, right? Um, and we're thinking about how valid or reliable are these criterion variables. How well does the SAT predict GPA? And that would give us an idea about how, um, how valid the SAT is in its use um, for college admissions, right? And we call this predictive evidence. We could also have something we call con um, concurrent evidence, and that would be two things at the same time. So if we wanted to have some evidence that the COGAT was a good measure of intelligence, we might give the COGAT at the same time as the WISC. We already know that the WISC is a great measure of intelligence, so we might give the COGAT and the WISC at the same time, and that would give us concurrent crit test criterion relationships, concurrent evidence. We can also have um, convergent and discriminant evidence. And we talked about this at the beginning of the semester, if you want to kind of think back to those first lectures. Um, so if the final exam in the state EOC would be an example of two measures of the same construct in different ways and discriminated evidence. Um, so we would expect different scores, right? I mean, the same scores on convergent evidence, I'm sorry. So um, those are two different measures. One was a teacher-created test, one was a state-created test. We would expect similar scores, right? Convergence. Discriminant would be um, the same type of test, the reading and the math FSAs. They're measuring different things. So one's measuring math and one's measuring reading. And we would expect different scores 
if the scores were the same, then they might be measuring the same construct, not different constructs, and that would be a problem, right? If that math test was relying too heavily on reading and we got the same scores on both, then we're not really getting a math score, right? We're getting a reading score. So we would want to see different scores on those two things. We also might get discriminant evidence by giving it to two different populations, right? So if I wanted um, evidence, discriminant evidence for a, for a physics test, right? And I gave this um, physics test to, to all of my education majors, and I gave it to a bunch of physics majors, and you guys got the same score on the test, I might think, wow, either my education students know a lot about physics, or I didn't make a very good physics test, right? I would expect there to be different scores between my education majors and my physics majors, right? Or if I gave an education test to a bunch of physics majors, I wouldn't expect them to do nearly as well as my education majors. So that might be another way to get discriminant evidence. I would expect different types of scores. So again, convergent measures, other measures of the same construct, discriminant, um, other constructs um, so that should not receive a positive correlation, right? So we can, all sources of validity can be classified as either convergent or discriminant. So if, I think that this is a really nice um, visualization of reliability and validity. So if we start at the left in that example, we see that um, all of the scores are really close together. They're giving us reliable, consistent results, but they're not valid. They're not measuring the thing I want to measure. In the middle two examples, we can see that they're not valid and they're not reliable. Um, in the in the first in that second one, we can see. They're not reliable, they're all over the place. There's no way that I can have any validity. I can't make any kind of recommendation on a score if I'm not getting consistent results, right? It's like stepping on that scale and getting a different weight every time. There's no way that I can make a recommendation about if I should gain weight or lose weight, if I should exercise more or eat more donuts, if I don't know how much I weigh, right? I'm um, in the same kind of for the second one, we can see low reliability and then that, and so therefore I can't make interpretations. And then the last one you can see we have both reliable and valid results. And really we can't have validity if we don't have reliability, right? But reliability means nothing if I don't have validity, right? So both are super important if I'm going to be evaluating a test. Okay, so in this, next, in this next set of slides, we're going to do a little bit of practice here and think about what would be a valid interpretation or a use for these scores. Okay, so the first one is a biology end of course exam. So the state biology end of course exam. How can I use these scores? Right, so it definitely tells me how much a kid knows about biology, right? Oftentimes, though, we use this biology EOC to determine what kind of chemistry class a student should be in. But is biology always a good predictor of chemistry? Hmm, right, they're really different sometimes. Okay, um, a solo voice audition. So I know I have some music ed majors in this class. So a solo voice audition. We oftentimes use solo voice auditions in order to um, predict who should be in which choir. Just because I sing well in a solo audition, does that mean that I'm gonna do well in a whole choir and blend well with a group? I actually don't know because I'm not a musician, but you guys can tell me. Okay, um, we're that PVVT, that Early Childhood Receptive Vocabulary Test. Um, how can I interpret those results? What are some ways in which I could use those results? Yeah, it tells us about what a kid knows, what words they understand, right? That might be good for placement into um, an English program or an ELL program, right, a TESOL program. Um, it might also tell us um, what their, what their, um, how well our, our our early childhood program is doing at teaching language, right? We know language is a big predictor of reading. What about an essay exam on the Civil War? It certainly tells us something about what they know about the Civil War, right? But what other things does it tell us? It probably tells us something about their reasoning abilities, right? And also their ability to write, and specifically to write about history, right? Which maybe is a different skill than writing in their English class. Okay, math word problems. Of course, there's some amount of computational skill that's involved, right? Um, also reading, right? You have to be able to read the problem. And then there's some amount of problem solving skills here too, right? So can they solve this problem? What about the fifth grade science FCAT? I wish I could say that it was just that what they learned in science in fifth grade, right? But it's actually, right? 
K through five science. Unfortunately, it's mostly what they were able to cram into fifth grade, right? Okay. Um, this is the advanced placement <laughs> art portfolio, right? Um, and I don't know how many of you guys, any of y'all take um, AP art in high school? So this is a little bit different than the other AP programs. And this, um, in AP art, the students actually put together a portfolio of their own work and they take, they photograph that work and then they, it's all around a theme and they have to show um, their expertise in a different media of art. So um, it's not just their skill in working with different art media, but it's also their ability to think about a theme. And it also has something to do with how well they photograph their work, right? Um, so it's a bunch of different skills involved. So that interpretation is maybe how well they would perform in a, high, in a college level work, right? So this is the in-class activity, and then um, if you want to pause your video and kind of work through this activity, um, I want you to think about um, how you could collect data for each of these um, ideas. So students' vocabulary, their reasoning skills, writing, uh, understanding the scientific method, music ability, and physical fitness. Um, and this is just kind of like an activity you can do on your own. If you have questions or you're not able to do this activity, I encourage you to contact me. You can email me and we can set up a time to talk on the phone or in my office um, so we can talk through these issues so that I can make sure that you understand before you get ready for that celebration of learning so that you're ready for that standardized case study assessment. I also encourage you to make sure that you've been working on that case study assessment. If you have any questions about the interpretation of that data, please let me know before Sunday night so that I can help you. Um, we can set up a meeting in my office. I'm happy to um, talk through some of that data with you to make sure that you really understand how to write that paper. And I look forward to reading them this week. Bye.